Good morning, good morning. It's good to see everyone here and see new faces here. Welcome. Um, I want to greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you know what today is, right? It's my, my day. It's Valentine's Day, right? Uh, because I tell my wife all the time, she gets to have a Valentine every single day of the year. <laughs> so, happy Valentine's Day. This morning when I was in prayer, I was reminded of something that, something about our Lord. And I want to read you this. It's Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercies endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. His mercies endures forever. You know, in John 15, 13, no greater love is this than a man lay his life down for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for us. What kind, of, what kind of love is that? That's really love, to sacrifice your life. And I want you to remember that, that because of Jesus Christ, that's how we know how to love. He set the example. He's the character that we want to follow. That's real love. That's true love. That's the kind of love that we want to have in our lives every single day, that we're willing to sacrifice our lives and the things that we want for someone that we love. And that's what he does all the time for us, right? He died on the cross so that we can have hope. And anybody need hope nowadays? Anybody needs hope? Anybody crying out for hope, crying out for an answer when everything around us is opposite of what God is showing us? That's why we depend on him. That's who we look to. So today, when we think about the loved ones, don't forget to say that you love your mom and dad, your husband and wife, your brother and sister. Don't forget to extend that love. It's always nice to hear, I love you. Don't be afraid to say it. Don't be afraid to tell your parents, I love you. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I care about you. You mean a lot to me. Even sometimes when it doesn't seem that way, it's always nice to hear it. I know it makes me feel good when my kids say, love you, Dad, and I have no problems saying I love you back and hugging them. Do that today. Today is the kind of day that we celebrate. But remember that... Before all this, he loved us first. Father, we give you thanks, Lord God, for today. We thank you, Lord God, for the love that you have shown us each and every day. We thank you that you set that example, Lord God, by loving us no matter what. No matter what we do, no matter what we say, you are there for us, Father. Father, I pray a blessing upon the people here today, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that your, your word today would just stir us up, Lord God, to do what you have called us to do, each one of us, Lord God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. I want to see you. Amen. 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 That's a good way to start a service. I want to see Jesus. Amen. I don't really want to see anybody else. Amen. Amen. We're going to take time, and we said we were going to have communion every Sunday for the next seven weeks, now six. And so I would like you to get your communion ready. And we're going to believe God. We're going to believe God because he's, He fulfills His promises. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. How He can fulfill His promise and how we can learn that we can trust Him. How many know that you can, you can really trust God? You, you really can. And it's just not a cliche. But we, we really do trust Him. And sometimes we're going to find out today, maybe we don't trust Him as much as we should. And that's when we get in trouble. That's when we look to man. And Kathy and I were just talking about this this morning. Or, you know, when we take our eyes off the Lord and put our eyes on man, man falls, we take it out on God. Like he did something wrong. It doesn't make any sense, does it? So, you know, with this communion, again, our theme is that we are, we're going to take the upper hand. In this pandemic, we're going to say, no, enough is enough. And God is, God is powerful. And the Word of God is true. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, the Scripture says. So we're going to receive this communion and on behalf of, maybe you know someone that's going through a struggle with this virus or whatever. And we thank God that those that have had it have come through with a very light symptoms and so forth, and uh, we're, we're grateful. So I want you to take your communion, and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray the same prayer that we prayed last week. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. May the stripes that fell on his back, because of those stripes, my body is healed. From the crown of my head to the very soles of my feet, every cell, every organ, every function of my body is healed, restored, and renewed in Jesus' name. I believe it, and I receive it. And when Jesus took the bread and he broke it, he gave thanks to the Lord, and Jesus said, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu mele ha'olam ha'motzis lekum mid ha'horez. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And it was then that the Messiah added these words, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together, meditating on the broken body of the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let us partake together the body of Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you didn't change your mind, that Jesus did not his will but your will and went all the way to the cross for us, not just for the forgiveness of our sin but for the healing of our bodies. I pray, God, that we will receive that healing as your word says, we discern the Lord's body today. And when we don't discern it, many are sick and among you and even die. But we discern your body today that you paid the price for our healing. And then he took the cup, which is the cup of redemption. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your precious blood. Your sin-free, disease-free, poverty-free life is in your blood. And your blood was removed, has removed every sin from my life. Through your blood I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future, and made completely righteous. Today I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and provision. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. And then Jesus took the cup. He said, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, but it's our own righteousness that falls short. 
And though the Lord searched, he could find no one to intercede for him, so his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. Jesus, the Messiah, lifted up the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, just as the blood of the Lamb brought salvation in Egypt. So Messiah's atoning death can bring salvation to all who believe. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Bori pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Let us gratefully drink together in the name of our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bring healing, God, to those that need healing. Bring strength to those that are weak, God. Bring blessings to those who are looking to you, God, for their blessings. You are the God that healeth us. You are the all-sufficient one. Your name, you reveal yourself in your name, Yahweh, the all-sufficient one. If you need strength, he's your strength. If you need salvation, he's your savior. Thank you, Father, for being all-sufficient to each one of us today. For whatever our need is, you are here to meet that need. And we receive it now. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen, amen. If we're going to be looking today at the 12th chapter of, of the Gospel of St. Luke, if you have a Bible, and we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about something today that I, I really believe that this is, I, I believe that every message that we look into the scriptures is important, but this particular message today, uh, I, I've, I've had to go over it in my own life, and, and I'm the first partaker of, of this because, it, you know, if it's going to hit me, if it's going to hit you, it's going to hit me first. But I know what the Lord wants to do in our lives, and so I pray that this, this message will, will help us understand how much God wants to be a blessing to you. Amen? Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word today. Let it be what, what you have called it to be, to teach us, to let your Holy Spirit reach out and touch every single one of us, God. We all fit into this lesson today. And we can all be overcomers because you overcame. So we give you praise. Help us let the anointing of your word become upon us today that we can receive it, God, and plant that seed in our heart and have our lives changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This past week I looked up a website called theworrycompany.com. Anybody ever look up theworrycompany.com? It's the world's leading provider of worrying services. The title page reads, Forget your worries. Your worrying days are over. Let us worry for you and your friends. Our company is dedicated to lifting the burdens of worries off your shoulders. By becoming a member of the Worry Company, you officially transfer all your worries to our highly trained professionals who will worry for you. Your worries will be declared null and void. They will enter into our computerized book of worries for a period of one year, and we will worry for you. P.S. We only use certified worriers. <laughs> now then you go to the next page and there's a list of gift items that you can purchase. Certificate of membership, $12.95. Coffee mug, $7.50. Tote bags, $12.95. T-shirts, $10.95. Teddy bears, $9.95. If you bought all these articles listed, you will have financial difficulties or financial worries. You'd be tempted not to pay the bill and let them, let them worry about it. Okay? Don't you wish it was that easy to get rid of your worries? The next time you worry about your children or your grandchildren, you just email the worry company and you're carefree. The next time you worry about your financial pressures or job stress, just turn it over to theworrycompany.com and relax. 
When you're waiting for the lab results to come, you just release it to the uh, certified warrior, and you're as cool as a cucumber. Amen? And we smile, we laugh at that because it's ridiculous. We know it's, it, it's a gimmick. But Jesus Christ does want to be the Lord of our anxieties. He invites us to cast all our burdens on him, and he will carry the load for us. Three times in the scripture, in Luke 12, Jesus said, do not worry. Now, I think most of us would admit we worry. Would anybody like to be honest and say, but now we do worry. Come on, let's be real here today, all right? Some just occasionally, and for others, it's a career. Well, <laughs> Worry va varies from degrees, by degrees from mild to chronic. For some, worry is just a little nervousness that takes the edge off the day. For others, it's much more serious, much more serious. Chest pains, dizzy spells, panic attacks, nausea, change of appetite, withdrawal from people, insomnia, daily pills. Now, if you would classify yourself as a chronic worrier, please understand this and understand this truth that it is not wrong to go to a counselor or a doctor. And it is not anti-Christian to take prescribed medication. That may be God's way of beginning to help you. And there is good medication that doctors can give. And there is bad medication. And you've got you to be wise and use wisdom. Okay? But Jesus wants us to be free from worry. Our lives are to be characterized by faith, the Bible says, not fear. So I wanted to see three things that, that, I, that, I, that are suggested in this passage in Luke chapter 12 that can help us to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our anxieties and to live sin free or um, free from worry, lives free from worry, okay? So the first thing I see Jesus saying is this, understand that worry, now this might shock you, understand that worry is a sin, and that it can be overcome. You know, someone say, wow, I never knew worry was a sin. When God's word says, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness, do not lie, we know that to violate those commands is a sin. When Jesus says three times, do not worry, to violate that command is a transgression of his law. Now, we may think it's, it's a more respectable sin, but worry is a sin. Now, it's important that we distinguish, though, between worry and legitimate concern. Okay? Concern focuses on probable difficulties and produces action. But anxiety focuses on unlikely, doubtful difficulties and produces inaction or neglect. Jesus is not saying here, you know, let's just live haphazard lives. You know, don't be concerned. You got your kids playing in the garage and you got the garage. Don't be worried. Don't worry about the safety latch, you know, for the garage door. Or, or don't buy life insurance. Don't install smoke alarms. Don't fasten your seatbelts. Don't save for retirement. I'll take care of you. No, he's not saying that. In fact, the Bible says he taught us to count the cost, didn't he? He says, count the cost of building the tower before you begin. He said, like we said last week, he said, learn from the ant, you, what did it say last week, what was the word? You lazy bones, it says in the New Living Translation, calls them lazy bones, who works hard to store up for the winter. And often the best cure for worry is to take action. You're worried about the test, what do you do? You study. You're worried about your finances, you work out a new budget. You're worried about your health, you go to a doctor. You're worried about your marriage, you make sacrifices. That's not worry. That's legitimate concern that results in action. You got that? It results in action. Now, anxiety, anxiety focuses on uncontrollable, improbable circumstances, and it takes no action. 
Anxiety is always the one that asks, what if? What if? You know, what if the stock market crashes? What if I get cancer? What if my kid's marriage falls apart? What if the company falters? What if my grandchildren or get, get my grandchild gets into an accident? What if, what if, what if? Things we cannot control and cannot change. Okay? That's what anxiety is. It takes, and we, we can't control it. So we ask ourselves, why is worry a sin? And there's several reasons that. We, that adv he advises us, and one is this. One is worry wastes time, and it wastes energy. In verse 25 of Luke 12, it says, Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Can, it, can worry add anything to your life? Worry is kind of like racing your car engine when it's in neutral. You're wasting gasoline, and you're not going anywhere. Listen to this statistics. Statistic. One study shows that the average person's anxiety is focused 40% on things that will never happen, 30% on things that are, that are about the past that can't be changed, 12% on other people's opinion that can't be controlled, 10% of worry is about health, which only gets worse when we worry about it, and 8% of worry is about real problems that we will be faced with. That means 92% of the time, worry is about things that we cannot control. So it's a waste of time. What a, what a waste of time it is. Corey Ten Boom said, quote, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. You worry, and you could have been sleeping. You worry you could have been enjoying the game. You could have been deepening relationships. Have, haven't you said, oh, I wish I could go back and relive that day. It was such a wonderful day, but I was so worried about making a mistake. You know, I was so worried about uh, what was coming up that I, I just kind of missed it. Amen? Why is worry a sin? Well, secondly, worry also, it weakens or it impairs our personality. It weakens your personality. I'm going to tell you something, and, and, and I, I hope I hear an amen somewhere. When you're constantly fretting about something, you're not very much fun to live with. Isn't that the truth? You're, you're really not. You're, you're somber, you're critical, you're negative, you're withdrawn, you're preoccupied, you're absent-minded. Worry impairs or it weakens your personality. Also, worry, it also erodes your health. It erodes your health. There are all kinds of physical ailments that are stress-related. This is a fact. Ulcers, heart attack, high blood pressure, insomnia. Worry gives you wrinkles, premature aging, maybe even gray hair. Oh, Lord. That's why, huh? I once had black hair. How about this? Worry harms our witness, too. It harms our witness. Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12, Jesus said, And when you, when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and, and before the rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you when? At that time, what needs to be said. If you worry too much about how you're coming across as a witness, you're liable not to say anything at all, or, or you're not to come across well. And he said, don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will give you what you need to say, when you need to say it. Or if you're anxious about bad things happening to you, it is evidence to the world that you really don't believe what you say you believe. So worry impairs our witness. Are you with me? It impairs our witness. Another thing is, worry often distorts or it twists our judgment and results in wrong behavior, too. It, it often twists our judgment and results in wrong behavior. How many know that people can do stupid things when they're under stress? We do. I read this past week where a man in Indiana who bought a Ford Explorer and then after several months, he was unable to make payments. 
He worried that if he let the car be repossessed, his credit rating would be ruined. So he decided to deliberately wreck his car, total it out, and the insurance would cover the debt. And, and he would be back to even. So he found a, a lonely country road. Nobody was looking, he thought. And he drove his car deliberately into a tree at 35 miles an hour. He was uninjured. He got out of the car, assessed the damage, and he realized it might not be totaled. So he backed the car up and he ran into the tree again. Then he phoned the police on his cell phone, waited a half an hour. Policeman came and said, what happened here? The guy said, I must have fallen asleep and hit the tree. The policeman said, that's interesting. The farmer over there in the field that was working said some guy ran into the tree, backed up, and hit the tree again. That wouldn't be you, would it? The policeman then said sternly, if you attempt to turn this accident into your insurance company, you're going to be arrested for fraud. Now, now that guy has car payments he can't make and a car he can't drive. <laughs> and we, I don't know if we should be laughing at that or not. But worry distorts our judgment and it compounds our problems. Amen? But here's the biggest one. The biggest one is worry insults God. Worry insults God. That's the biggest reason. The primary reason we're anxious is that we want to control everything in our lives rather than trust God for our future. We want to be in control. Jesus said, that's behaving like the pagans who don't know God at all. In verse 28, Jesus labeled those who worry as you of little faith. Your father knows what you need and he will supply it. That's why worry is sin because it calls God a liar. Worry says, God, I don't believe you can do what you say you will do. God says, I will supply all your needs. Worry says, I don't think you will. God says, in the end, I will see that all things are working together for the good of those who love me. And worry says, I don't think that's going to be my experience. I don't think you'll keep your promise, God. God says, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And worry says, I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. That's why Oswald Chambers says, worry is spiritual infidelity. That's a heavy statement. Worry he associates with spiritual infidelity. We do not believe that God looks after the details of our life. That's what we're saying when we worry. So, how can worry be overcome? It can be overcome. We, we're inclined to say, you know, you know what? I, I'm a worrier. I, I've always been a worrier. I think it's in my genes. My mother was a worrier. Or, or, or this is just my temperament, it's just the way I am. But Jesus doesn't command us to do something that we cannot control. He'll never say something and tell you to do something that you won't have the power to do it or that you have the power to control. And he says, I want you to quit worrying and I want you to be calm people. You know, maybe some of you here today need to go on your knees and say, God, I've been faithless and I've sinned. Maybe that's what we have to do. I've, and, and ask for forgiveness and ask for the empowering of the Holy Spirit that will be able to overcome this problem. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And I quote verse 7 practically every single service. But first, uh, Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? Now, that doesn't mean that you'll never be tempted to worry again. But it means that when temptation arises, you can have victory over it. That's what it means. Okay? Now, the second counsel that Jesus gives us in this passage is this. It develops a re re realistic 
trust, a realistic trust in the destiny or what we call the divine intervention, or it's called the providence of God. And I know maybe you, 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 we don't use that word a lot, but I want you to learn that word today. Providence of God means God's destiny, God's divine intervention. Okay? He says, God is so good that he provides the daily needs for the least significant of his creation. He says, consider the ravens. Consider the ravens. Now, a raven is a scavenger that feeds on dead animals. Nobody likes to have ravens around. They're the least appreciated of all the birds. But you don't see a raven pacing up and down in a room wondering, I wonder if there's going to be any roadkill tomorrow, you know, whatever. You don't see that, really. You know, well, what's the weather report for tomorrow? What's, the, what's going on tomorrow, you know? And you can watch the Animal Channel for, for months, and they'll never show you a raven's nest with a storage shed next to it. No, no way. Yet a raven has enough to eat, every day. And, and Jesus said, if God is caring for the least of his creatures, you're so much more valuable than birds. Don't you think he's going to care for you? You're so much more valuable than birds. Don't you think he's going to care for you? This is what he wants you to think about. Then he goes on to say, consider the lilies, how they grow in the field. Now, lilies in Palestine grow in the wild. And lilies, uh, they don't need any attention. They, they don't need any cultivation, no overseeing. They just cover the hillsides, and they are beautiful. They're beautiful. Listen to the, what the Message Paraphrase Bible, how it describes this. This is, this is really wonderful. I don't even know if I, we have this on. We have the message? We do. Okay. It says, have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. Jesus said, even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, what's the next three words? How much more? Say that with me. How much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, you are much more important, believe me, than flowers or birds. You're much more important. He's asking, how much evidence do you have to have in your lifetime before you conclude, God is taking care of me? How much evidence do you have to have? I mean, how many times are you going to sit down at the table to eat when you're hungry before you say, you know what? God has cared for me and given me enough to eat all these years, I think I'm always going to have enough to eat. Or how many articles of clothing will have to hang in your closet before you say, you know what? God is going to provide me with enough clothes to wear. Or how many nights will you go to bed with a roof over your head and a secure place to, to sleep before you say, I think I'm always going to have somewhere to sleep. Or how many prayers have to be answered in your life before you say, you know what? God is taking care of me. How much stuff, how much stuff are you going to have to accumulate before you say, that's enough, I'm content. I've got what I need. Beautiful song that I love is, and it means something in this message. His, the, the song says, his eye is on the sparrow, right? And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen? Well, let's be realistic this morning. Let's, let's, let's be real, realistic. Our trust needs to be real. God's providence, his destiny, his divine intervention does not mean exemption from difficulties. It doesn't mean that. Consider the birds. You know what happens to birds? You know what happens to birds? Birds die. Bird eggs get eaten sometimes, snakes. Other animals, birds are sometimes attacked by other birds, other animals. Or consider the lilies of the field. What happens to them? The Bible says they're here today and tomorrow they're thrown into, fu into the fire. What it's saying is, let's, let's face reality. Let's, let's face reality. Some people will tell you, you know, the best way to overcome worry is to just put it out of your mind. 
Put it out of your mind. Don't think about it. Nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. You know what? If that's your approach, your peace is going to be very short-lived. Very short-lived. The best way to overcome worry is to face the truth. Face the truth. People do die. Couples get divorced. Kids have accidents. Stocks plunge. Companies go bankrupt. Horrible things happen in this world. Be real. Face the truth. The Lord says, I'm not going to exempt you from the difficulties outside, but I'm going to reinforce you from within so that what, whatever happens, you'll be able to stand up under it. And that's why he says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's what he's talking about. Now listen, you see, a young woman who wants to get pregnant knows that there's going to be discomfort and there's going to be pain. But she wants the end result, so she will endure the pain. Amen? Amen. The providence of God is not shallow, or everything is going to turn out okay. Don't worry. God, no, no, no. God's providence means God is going to reinforce me through whatever comes my way. I can do it through Christ who strengthens me. That's why I love 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Listen to what it says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. But God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. You can do it. That's what it's saying. You can do it. When you say amen, Amen. You see, trusting God's providence doesn't mean a shallow. It's, it, it's, it's not going to let anything bad happen to me. It's saying whatever happens, whatever happens, even death, he's going to give you me enough strength to get through it when that time comes. That's why the 23rd Psalm is so special. That's why it's so precious. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And then he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. That's what makes it so special. Amen? The final thing I see him teaching here in this 12th chapter is to keep your daily focus on the spiritual. Keep a spiritual focus every day. Let's, let's, let's go on and see what the rest of Jesus' teaching is beginning at verse 29 of chapter 12 and following. Listen to this. And don't be concerned about what to eat or what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and He will give you everything you need. What a beautiful verse. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And he will give you everything you need. The reason we worry is that we've got our focus on this world only. If your primary focus is on financial security, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much insurance or how many things you accumulate, you're going to worry about them because you cannot totally control them. If your primary focus is on your health, you know what? doesn't matter how much you exercise or how much oatmeal you eat. You're going to worry about your health. Why? Because you're getting older. Amen? If your primary focus is on your children, I guarantee you, you will worry about them all your life. Why? Because you cannot control them. Can I get a witness? Is there any parent in here that knows what I'm talking about? Amen? Amen. Jesus is saying, get your focus off this world and onto the kingdom of God because that is permanent. Lay up treasures in heaven and put your heart there. That will eliminate worry. Okay? If, if you're getting your focus on your heart, on this world, you're only going to have worries and anxieties. You put your treasure in heaven where your treasure is, the Bible says, your heart is also. Look at verse 32. It says, don't be afraid, little flock. Don't be afraid. For it gives your Father great happiness to give you the kingdom. 
give you the seek the seek the kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. That's what the scripture's saying. C.S. Lewis said it this way. You aim for heaven and you get the whole world thrown in. You aim at the earth and you get neither. It makes sense. It makes sense. All right. So how do we develop a spiritual focus? How do we do that? How do we develop spiritual focus? Well, first of all, if you're listening to this message and you're, or you're here or you're listening online, um, if you haven't already done so, the first thing to do is become a Christian. You become a Christian. If your sins are not forgiven and you don't have, and, and, and you don't have the promise of eternal life, you need to be concerned and you need to take action. You need to confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and allow the blood of Christ to cleanse you of your sins so that you can know you have the promise of eternal life. Amen? The next thing you do after you become a Christian is you worship him regularly. Reg One of the reasons we come to church regularly is, is to get our focus on those things that are above. That's what our worship is. I wish we had more time and we can worship even more, but I'm thankful for what, what, what we have. Ruth Graham said this, fear and faith cannot be in the same heart. Worship and worry are mutually exclusive. I thought, what a beautiful statement that is. Worship and worry are mutually exclusive. That's why, one of my uh, another favorite song. that's why when we can sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Well, I, I love that song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The third way we get our focus on things above is to review God's promises. Review God's promises. If you struggle with worry, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great exercise to you know, write down the Scripture, either on a card or maybe on the flyleaf of your Bible, and when anxiety times come, I would just go back and review His promises. Whatever they are, you pick out some Scripture. I'm going to give you three. Just write down maybe the verse, and maybe this will help you, but you can search the Scriptures yourself to, to, to strengthen you with God's promises. How about Psalms 3? Psalms 3, verse 5 and 6, it says this, I lay down and I sleep. I awake because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. I will not fear. That's Psalms 3, 5 and 6. How about Psalms 46 verses 1 and 2. 46, 1 and 2 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, we will not fear. God's promise. Psalms 46, 1 and 2. How about this one? One of my favorites, too. Psalms 91, verse 1 and 2. He who dwells and the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You know, I'd write those promises down and I'd review them. I'd try to memorize them. And after I got done, I would ask myself, do I believe what I say I believe? Do I really believe it? If I believe this, then I'm going to turn my worries over to the Lord. If I believe what I say, I believe. Amen? Another thing that he says to do is this, in this passage is this. He says, lay up treasures in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. Verse 33 and 34. Lay up treasures in heaven. Listen to what it says. Sell your possessions and give, those, give to those in need. This will store up treasures for you in heaven. And the persons of heaven never get old or de develop holes. Your treasures will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. You see, God commands us to give our possessions away. Not because the church needs it, or not because the poor need it, and certainly not because God needs it, but because we need it. We need it. We're holding on to things of the earth loosely. 
And when you're, when, when you're anxious about, say, financial worries, one of the best things to do is just to start giving some of it away. Just as a reminder that this world is not our home. This world, is, and you need to remind yourself. Okay? The final thing is learning the art of living one day at a time. Learn the art of living one day at a time. The birds go to sleep every night not knowing what's going to be out there the next day, but God provides for them. The flowers are here today and gone tomorrow. Amen? In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I like this expression someone said, yesterday is history, Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift from God. That's why it's called the present. I like that. I think it's true. And folks, you know what? We are spoiled. We're spoiled. We think in our mind that life is supposed to be worry-free, no pressure. And if you're waiting for those times in life you will have, when you will have no stress, no pressure, you're going to waste about 98% of your life. Okay? The key to living the victorious, abundant life that Christ wants us to live in is to say with the psalmist, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I can't change yesterday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but God is, per is permitting me to be alive today. And even though I've got some pressures, I'm going to live it to the fullest. Amen? And when you repent of worry and turn your burdens over to the Lord, trust Him for the future, and you're really focused on spiritual things, you will find out that He is the one who is certified to carry your burdens for you. Amen? Give the Lord a hand of praise because He's the one that's certified. Let's all stand together in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank You so much that we can turn our worries over to you. And as we close this service, I don't know, Ron, if we have enough time for that song that you wanted to do. We don't. We can go a minute or two over if we need to. Ron chose a beautiful song for us to close. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want us to be blessed. Go ahead and do it. In Jesus' name. Then we'll... we'll, we'll... <laughs>
Thank you, Jesus. I know we went a little bit over 10 o'clock. So that means we have to leave a little bit, make room for the tent. But I don't care. Because we needed to hear that. We needed to hear that in our hearts today. He overcame. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We can overcome worry, anxiety. We can do all things through Christ. He strengthens us. No matter what you're going through today, He will strengthen you. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you, give you hope. Hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Give you joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. He will give you peace. A shalom peace. That passes human understanding. We can be at peace even in the midst of pandemics and what the world is craziness is going through. God, thank you for the peace that will guard our hearts and guard our minds as we live in Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for today. Bless your people now as we leave in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. With your mask on, turn to someone. Tell them it was good to be in the house of the Lord today. God bless you. <laughs>